Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar? Yes? This is Christian Albeck at International Life and Casualty in Boston. Well, Mr. Albeck, I haven't heard from you in three or four years. Uh, no. How are you? Fine. Just fine, Mr. Dollar. But I'm afraid I have a bit of a problem. Well, who hasn't? And I wonder if you could... Uh... What was that? Nothing. You were going to say? Uh, I wonder if you're free to come up here and see me right away. I don't know why not. As long as you're willing to pay my expense account and commission. And, uh... Maybe a little extra fee in addition. Well, that remains to be seen. Of course, there is a quarter million dollar policy involved. Say no more. I'm on my way. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the International Life and Casualty Insurance Company Home Office, Boston, Massachusetts. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the three-for-one matter. Expense account item one, seven seventy five, plane fare to Boston. Item two, two and a quarter for a cab to International's office in the little building at the corner of Tremont and Boylston, across from the Terrain Hotel. Come to think of it, it's not too far from station W E E I that carries the broadcast reports on these cases. Christian Albeck is in his late forties, tall, blonde, lantern jawed. His casual manner and rather bland expression belie a sharp, keenly analytical mind. I've always had the feeling that he might always be just one jump ahead of me. Sit down, won't you, Mr. Dollar? Thank you, Chris. Only, uh, why the mister? Well, after all, you are in Boston, you know. <laughs> Cigarette? Thank you. Yeah, it's fairly noon. I take it you come up here by plane. Mm-hmm. With an ulterior motive. I figured if I got here in time for lunch, I might persuade you to put the bill over at the old Union Oyster House. Well, why not? Afterwards, we can pick up a rental car for you. Oh? Yes. See, it'll be necessary for you to run up to Center Harbor in New Hampshire. Up there at Lake Winnipesaukee again. Yes, where you handled a case for us once before. Great. Huh? Well, it's pickerel, perch, smallmouth bass. Only why didn't you tell me that on the phone, Chris, so I could have brought along some fishing tackle? This time of year? Oh, that's right. I kind of lost my head. Now, why don't we go on over to the oyster house, and while you're gorging yourself on seafood, I can tell you what this is all about. Fine. Another dozen on the half shell, Mr. Dollar? Oh, are you kidding? I've had it. <laughs> oh, I just hope I can make it up to Lake Winnipesaukee. And come to think of it. To what, Chris? To see if you can find out what's happened to a Mr. John Stuart Kirkman. Kirkman? Yes. He and his wife live on Red Hill Road up there at Center Harbor. He's a man of about 60, retired, worth quite a lot of money. I see. His wife telephoned me just before I called you this morning. She gave me no details, but it seems that Mr. Kirkman left the house sometime after dinner last evening, presumably to see a man on business of some kind or other. And, uh, well, she simply hadn't seen or heard anything of him since. A quarter million dollar policy, hmm? Yes, with a double indemnity clause. She's checked with this man that he went to see? Well, she doesn't know who it was. Well, what about the police up there? Um, Chief Mike Sharp, isn't it? Yeah. I talked to him this morning, too. He'll give you all the details, and he's happy you're on the case. Well, he thinks a lot of you, Johnny, uh, Mr. Dollar, and uh, he promises complete cooperation. Well, good. Uh, incidentally, now, um... Yeah? Uh, well? Uh, no. Nothing. I, um... Uh, well, you see what you think when you get up there. What I think about what, Chris? Forget it. No, no, no. Wait a minute. You have got an idea, maybe, about someone who might have helped? Mr. Kirkman disappear? I didn't say that. Now, don't start that again. Again? That other case up there, Winnipesaukee. If you told me your suspicions right at the beginning, it would have saved me a lot of trouble and your company a lot of expense. Yeah, but if I'd been wrong... But you were absolutely right. Yeah, quite possible that I'm wrong this time. Who do you suspect, Chris, of wanting to get him out of the way? Well, then, who is the beneficiary of this policy that he holds? His wife, Mona. Quarter of a million, hmm? Yeah. Or maybe double that. But I'm thinking of... Well, 
three people, Donna, who might, and I use the word might. Now, mind him. Go on. Who are they? Well, it's Charles B. Hockaway. Who's he? Hockaway, a sort of um, junior partner for a while in Mr. Kirkman's investment business here in Boston. Before Kirkman retired, went up there to live in Santa Harbor. Mm-hmm. What about him? The Hockaway borrowed a lot of money from him on a handshake, no contract. Never paid it back. For the simple reason that he's a completely impractical, incompetent wastrel. How much? Nearly $100,000, I understand. Mm. Anyhow, the last time I talked to Mr. Kirkman, he said he was going to take legal action, even if it meant complete ruin for Hockaway. Did he? I don't know. I do know that Hockaway was not only worried, but bitterly resentful. He was? Yeah, he said he'd really earned the money, which isn't true. That Kirkman didn't need it, and that he'd see him in Hades before paying a cent of it. And a couple of months ago, Harkaway quietly took a little cottage up there in Santa Harbor. Do you think that in order to avoid paying off his debt, he would go so far as to... No, I didn't say that. Uh, then there's Mildred. Mildred who? Armstrong. She was Kirkman's first wife. When he divorced her, he made what was then a very generous settlement, but... Uh, Later, when he began to get really wealthy and wouldn't add to what he'd given her, well, I just happen to know that she's been threatening him for years. Threatening to kill him? Now, Mr. Dollar, I didn't... All right, all right, you didn't say that. No. But she, too, has recently moved to Santa Harbor. Well, now, Chris... And finally, there's Tony Benson, who's turned up in Wolfsboro on the other side of the lake. And who is he? He's a fairly bright young fellow. Basically, just a bomb. Just an irresponsible young... Uh, Mr. Dollar, Tony has been in more scrapes. And I'll wager he's had at least a dozen different jobs in the last ten years. There have been absolutely no good in any of them. Right now, he's a sort of um, dental assistant for Dr. Porteous. And what's his beef? Mona, Mr. Kirkman's wife. Tony was in love with her once, or with her fortune, really, but uh, Kirkman beat him to it. I thought Kirkman himself had the money. It was hers that enabled him to build up his business, therefore his own fortune, to the point where he could retire in four years. Oh. Anyhow, I don't think Tony would stop at anything to get even. Now, wait a minute. Get even with Kirkman or his wife? Frankly, knowing the way that love can turn to hatred in such a case, I would have thought with Mona... Now, of course... Uh... Well, they're pretty thin motives, it seems to me, Chris, all of them. But you think that one of those three might possibly have decided to put Kirkman out of the way. But... No, I didn't say that. I only Okay, meant to... okay, Chris. Let's get out of here. Get me a car and I'll be on my way. <laughs> Item three, 50 bucks deposit on a rental car. By the time I'd covered the 125 miles or so to Center Harbor, it was late afternoon. Police Chief Mike Sharp was out of his little office, so I left a note on the door, went over and checked in at the Garnet Inn. I wondered which of the people that Chris had mentioned I should contact first. If that is anything actually had happened to Mr. Kirkman. Yes, come in. Well, howdy, Mr. Dollar. Chief Sharp, nice to see you. I thought maybe it was you who'd moved in here, and I saw that rental car out front. Here I am. About that Mr. John Stuart Kirkman, the man you come up here to look for? Yes. Might have saved yourself trouble, Mr. Dollar. Just found him myself. Oh, well, good. Found his body, rather. Mr. Kirkman's dead. Stone dead. Curve up ahead there. Right, Chief. Yeah, that is, unless you want the same thing to happen as happened to Mr. Kirkman. Uh, maybe you better stop along about here. Yes. I see those tire tracks on over the edge of the curve and on through the broken fence there beyond. Yeah. That's what happened to him, all right. Lost control, Mr. Curve went on over the edge. Yeah, there. Now, see how he'd hit the bottom down there? Yeah. Uh, 60 or 70 feet. Mm. Yeah, come along, Miss Dollar. Uh, that's the step here. Yep. Put in is not so good on this side of the hill. Yeah, I uh, see that. Uh, Who is that down there? Old Doc Higby. He's the coroner. 
I want him just to be sure that body's all right. How do you mean, all right? Well, it looks pretty obvious, like an accident, but you didn't have a chance to look at those tire tracks as careful as I did. Oh, I think I know what you mean about them, Chief. Do you? Yeah, there were no skid marks. They show that he tried to put on the brakes before going over. Ah, that's right. Those tracks are so clear, so plain, Mr. Dollar. You wonder if Kirkman wasn't dead before he hit the curb, hmm? That's a possibility. Yeah, maybe somebody killed him and propped him up behind the wheel and helped that car over the edge. Yes, sir. So, if Doc Higby has found any sign on him, any sign at all, I... Well, how about it, Doc? Well, not a mark, Chief Sharp. Not a single mark onto him. Except for the blow to his head that killed him when the car rolled over. You're sure of that, Dr. Higby? Yeah. Eh? I mean, there's no other mark that might possibly have accounted for his death. You're absolutely certain of that, hmm? Now, just a minute, young man. Who is this young man uh, it's talking to me like this? Now, 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 Doc. This is Mr. Johnny Dollar. He's no. kind of a special investigator. Johnny investigate. Dollar? The insurance investigator? Yeah, that's right. Well, now... Uh, Howdy, Mr. Dollar. I'm mighty pleased to meet you. Well, thank you, Doctor, but, um... You'll have to pardon his sparking up that way, Mr. Dollar. I guess we folks around here have him spoiled. He's just not used to having someone question his professional opinion. Yes, sir. Oh, that's perfectly all right, and I'm glad to know you, Doctor. Well, but, uh... Uh, now, knowing how thorough you always are, Mr. Dollar, you see, I listen to all those reports on your cases over the radio, uh, mostly on WGAN and over to Portland and on WEEI down to Boston. Well, I'm glad to hear that, sir. So, I suppose, in spite of my opinion, in spite of the way this looks like an accident, uh, maybe I'd better do an autopsy. I think it might be a good idea, Doctor, because if he was killed before the car rolled on down here... I'll do it right away. If you two will help me get the body down to my car that's down below. Sure. Uh, in the meantime, Chief Sharp. Yeah, in the meantime, Mr. Dollar, just in case. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> there are three people I'd like to make certain are still about in these parts. Like Charles P. Hockaway, for instance? Well, yes. But how'd you know? And uh, perhaps Mildred Armstrong and Tony Benson? Yes, sir. Especially that Tony Benson over to Wolf's Bar. Okay, while you're rounding them up, I want a mechanic to look over the brake system on this car to find out, if possible, why it went over the edge. That's a good idea. While well, you and Doc take in the body, I'll get a hold of Frank Marshall over at the gas station to look at the brakes, and then I'll round up those people you mentioned. Fine. I didn't stick around to watch the autopsy, thank you, but uh, went back to the Garnet Inn. It was dinner time, and in spite of the hefty lunch in Boston, I was hungry again. But as I went to my room to wash up... It's funny, I guess I forgot to lock it. Oh, you locked it, all right. What? Who are you? You're Johnny Dollar, aren't you? That's right. Well, I'm Tony Benson. Well. I saw the note you left on the door at Chief Sharp's office. I came over here to wait for you. Got tired of standing around, so I came up here and slipped the lock with a business card. Any objection? And, uh, if I decided that, uh, you should be held for breaking and entering... <laughs> Well, it's a lot better than being held for murder, isn't it? Murder? Well, that's what that crazy old police chief would do in a minute if uh, he could cook up something wrong about the way old Kirkman's car went over that cliff. Oh, you know about it. Doesn't everybody? <laughs> but I don't want anybody accusing me of murder. Why should they? Because they all think I had a grudge against Kirkman, that's why. Didn't you? No. It wasn't him that did me dirt. It was that, uh... Well, it was Mona that left me flat. If I had a grudge against anybody, it was against her, not him. Well, if you don't believe me, ask her. Maybe I will. Anyhow, when I found out you were here, at least I knew I'd get a fair shake for a change. Tony, you said murder. Hmm? What makes you think Kirkman was murdered when all the signs point to an accident out there? Hmm? Uh, well, uh... <laughs> now, now, listen, all, all I said was that old Chief Sharp would try and... Well, you know, cook up something or something just because he... Well, he doesn't like me. Maybe he has good reason. Yeah? Wait a minute. Johnny Dollar. My name is Mildred Armstrong, Mr. Dollar. Yes. I must see you right away. Oh, what about? You know very well what about. About John Kirkman. And I'm not the one who murdered... Uh, I mean, had him murdered. What makes you think he's been murdered, Miss Armstrong? Well, I... 
Well, he's dead, isn't he? Yes, he's dead all right, but it looked like an accident. Oh. Oh, well, I, I didn't know. Then there won't be any silly suspicion of me. Well, should there be? I, I beg your pardon? Are you here in Center Harbor? Yes. Why? Well, then I think you'd better come on over here and see me. Now, just a minute. Or would you rather I had Chief Sharp bring you over? Very well, Mr. Dollar. I'll, I'll be over to see you. All right, now, Tony. So, maybe now you got a better suspect, huh? What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, if old Kirkman was murdered, I mean, what you said to that Armstrong dame. If... Now, look, if you want my opinion... No, now, I think thank you. you. Oh, now what? Mr. Um, Johnny Dollar? That's right. Well, I'm glad to see you here. My name is... Hi. Tony! Charlie boy, come on in. Join the party. Mr. Hockaway, is it? Oh, yes. At this point, I guess I can only say I've been expecting you. I'm afraid I, I don't understand. Well, you came to tell me perhaps that... Uh, that I didn't murder John Kirkman. Yeah, that word seems to be getting pretty common around here. Uh, what's that? How do you know he's been murdered? Oh, I see. <laughs> A little slip of the tongue and you've immediately become suspicious. Well, don't, old man, because there's no reason to. What I meant was... Uh, well, y you know. Now, what did you mean, Mr. Hockaway? Well, just that if there should turn out to be anything suspicious about the, uh... Well, let's face it, Dollar. Kirkman and I were not on very good terms. Yes, so I understand. Careful, Charlie. You're sticking your neck out. But if there should be any question of murder, old man, uh, well, needless to say, I didn't, didn't do, do it. it. That's right. I'm glad you understand. Sit down, Hockaway. Oh, uh, surely, Mr. Dollar. Chief? Yeah, this is Miss Armstrong, Mr. Dollar. Met her on the way over after I checked with Frank Marshall about the car. Oh, uh, won't you go on in, Miss Armstrong? <laughs> well, <laughs> Miss Armstrong. Yes, to where the other two are that I... Huh? Yeah. Where'd you find them, Mr. Dollar? Well, let's say they found me, Chief. Uh, have you checked with Dr. Higby? Yeah. Let's shut this door a little. Sure. Well? Looks like we were wrong. Doc says it was the accident killed Mr. Kirkman, no doubt about it. Mm. So all this roundup of suspects... Uh... Chief, what did uh, Frank Marshall say about the brakes on the car? Yeah, he went over it with a fine-tooth comb, Mr. Dollar. Nothing tampered with, no loose connections, nothing wrong at all. I see. Well, me, one thing, there was no fluid in the brake lines. What? You know, that copper tubing that carries the fluid. Oh, but only because of a tiny little leak, a little hole so small that even his smallest drill wouldn't fit in it. That car is pretty new. Yeah. So it must have been just a defective piece of that tube in let fluid leak out. Wait a minute. Hold everything. Uh, Chief. Yeah? Look, go on in there and keep an eye on the suspect while I go over and take a look at that car, will you? Yeah, but I thought the suspect. That's right. But who? Which one? Judging by the way they all descended on me as though to make sure I wouldn't suspect them, it could be any one of them. But you just sit tight right here and we'll see. Hi, Charlie. See you in the morning. Now, uh... Yes, Frank? Well, like I told Chief Sharp, Mr. Dollar, must have been an accident. These brake lines on this car have been tampered with, and uh, I would have known it right away. Well, I'm sure you would, Frank. Sure. Any wrench or other tool been put on any connections, any bleed lines, I'd have noticed. Kind of would have disturbed the mud from that last rain we had. Would have left a mark. Mm -hmm. There was no saw marks, anything like that, anywhere on that copper tubing. And I also checked the master cylinder and all four wheel cylinders, too. Well, then how do you account for no fluid in the lines? Well, now, I thought about that myself. Count if I'd checked the fluid level last time I did a lube job on this car last week. The chief said that there is a small hole in one of the lines. Uh, yes, sir. It's a defect in the tubing. Leastwise, it's much too small for any drill point. Is it? Oh, yes, sir. And I know because I got drill points in my kit all the way down to 128th of an inch. And the hole's a lot smaller than that. Mm. Is it all right if I get under and take a look? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Here, you can use this crawler here. Just lay down, roll under. Good. Do you have a flashlight? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, right here. Is there any kind of a magnifying glass around oh, here? Yeah, sure. You can use this little pocket magnifier if you want. Okay, fine. <laughs> The hole in that copper tubing that carries the brake fluid was tiny. But under the magnifying glass, it was all too obvious that someone had drilled it there. And remember this. Where an ordinary metal drill leaves a burr, a bit of metal shaving on the edge of a hole that it's cut. Here, there was none. 
See it under there? Too small for any kind of drill. Much too small. Any kind? Sorry, Frank. That's where you're wrong. Oh, howdy, Mr. Dollar. Chief. Ah, where you been, Dollar? Not digging up another suspect for the murder that wasn't a murder after all? Yes, the chief has just told us it was an accident due to faulty brakes. All right, it's uh, it's all over. It's all settled uh, now. So you see, Mr. Dollar, I told you there was no cause for suspicion. Right. So come on, let's get out of here. Just huh? one question first. Yes. Yes. What is it, Mr. Dollar? What is it? Tony? Yeah? You're a dental assistant, aren't you? Well, yeah, that's right. Then you ought to be more careful with the equipment. Now, what do you mean by that? Oh, don't you remember what you did with this dental drill that you borrowed from the office? Well, but... This tiny drill that you used to drill a hole in that brake line. No. You don't remember where you put this drill without bothering well... to clean it? Without bothering to clean off the chips of copper on it? After you used it on the brake line? Well, Tony? You're pretty smart, you know. No. Just smart enough. So, once again, it's up to the courts. And how about the switch on this one? I mean, the logical suspect being the logical suspect for once. Expense account total, including board and room, mileage on the rental car, and the trip back to Hartford, plus incidentals, of course, eighty-one fifty. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, one of the cleverest ways to work a racket that ever tripped up a crook. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr. Musical supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Leora Thatcher as Mildred, William Mason as Tony, Robert Donnelly as Chris, Robert Dryden as the police chief, Reynold Osborne as Charles, Arthur Cole as the doctor, and Bill Lipton as Frank. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Art Hannah speaking.